Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for an MP webinar on employee classification. Please note this is a two-part series to be continued next Thursday at 1. I'm Amy Lehman, Head of Marketing here at MP. And for those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full-service human capital management company offering a suite of products and services, including HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I am thrilled to introduce your two presenters today, two of MP's HR experts, Sherry Heller and Mary Jane Stewart. Sherry is a SHRM and PHR certified HR partner here at MP. She has over 20 years of experience in employee relations, training and development, strategic planning, and policy development. Sherry earned a Master of Education in Instructional Design from UMass. She spent many years in retail management prior to getting into HR, which provides her with a unique business focus to human resources. Mary Jane is an HR advisor here at MP, and she provides HR support to businesses in a variety of industries. Mary Jane has over 30 years of HR experience providing strategic and tactical support to leaders of organizations in various aspects of HR. Her specialties include organizational and policy development, performance management, employee relations, compliance, compensation, training, and other related HR areas. Just a few quick housekeeping questions, uh, notes before we begin. If you'd like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And also we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar later today um, along with the slides. And with that, I'm going to hand the mic off to Sherry. Thank you, Amy. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. We always start with our legal disclaimer. Uh, this training is intended for educational and informational purposes only. Uh, we do hope you get a lot out of today's presentation, but we are not attorneys and we don't want anything construed as legal advice. And we are gonna be talking a lot about employment law today for sure. All right, so our presentation topics today, uh, first we're going to talk about what is the FLSA, the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the age-old question, exempt or non-exempt. Uh, then we'll go into a little bit more detail about the FLSA guidelines on non for non-exempt employees and for overtime pay. Uh, we'll review some of the more common white-collar exemptions, and then we'll talk about record keeping and enforcement. All right, so what is the FLSA? So the Fair Labor Standards Act, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I just wanted to make one, one, one important note. Um, so the focus of today's training is on federal regulations only. It is very important to be aware of the state and local labor laws in all locations where you have employees, because oftentimes they are more stringent than the FLSA. All right, so now define, uh, talking about the FLSA, uh, it was enacted back in 1938. Uh, to really to protect workers from un unfair employment practices. Uh, the FLSA basically established standards for minimum wage, overtime pay, record keeping requirements, and youth employment. So the FLSA does not require employers to provide time off for holidays, vacations, or sick leave, meal periods, or rest breaks. It doesn't require premium pay for weekends or holidays. Uh, doesn't require any uh, notice prior to termination or layoff, and doesn't require any pay raises or fringe benefits. But keep in mind, as I mentioned, sometimes state and local laws are going to uh, dictate uh, a lot of these uh, guidelines. So even though the FLSA doesn't address them, they may be addressed at the state or local level. All right. And then back in 2019, uh, the Department of Labor announced a final rule that updated the FLSA and really made about approximately 1.3 million American workers newly eligible for overtime pay effective uh, at the beginning of 2020. Uh, the department didn't make any changes to the duties test, but what they did do was they raised the standard salary level, which we'll talk a little bit about coming up, uh, from 4.55 a week to 6.80, uh, excuse me, 6.84 a week, which is equivalent to 35,568 a year for a full-time worker. It also raised the total annual compensation requirement for that highly compensated employee white collar exemption from $100,000 a year to 107 for 30, 32, excuse me. 
So as I mentioned at the beginning of the training, these are the federal guidelines for exempt employees. Many states and cities have their own salary thresholds. So for example, in California, exempt employee salary threshold is actually 54,080. In New York State, it's 48,750. And then in New York City, it's 58,500. So again, even though we're talking about the federal guidelines under the FLSA, really important, I can't emphasize enough, to make sure that you're aware of the guidelines in the uh, states in which you operate. The other thing the overtime update or the new rule uh, established was uh, non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments are now able to satisfy up to 10% of that standard salary requirement. Uh, this really was just in, sort of in recognition of some of the evolving pay practices throughout the years. <clears throat> so such bonuses uh, would include non-discretionary incentive bonuses that are tied to productivity or profitability. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and for employers uh, to credit non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments toward a portion of the standard salary level test, payments have to be made on an annual or more frequent basis, and the employee must be paid a base salary of $615.60, which is 90% of that salary threshold of 684. So if an employee doesn't earn enough in non-discretionary bonuses and incentive payments, which includes commissions, um, in that given 52-week period, uh, to retain their exempt status, the Department of Labor permits you to do a catch-up payment at the end of that 52-week period. So the employer has one pay period to make up that shortfall. Again, it's up to 10% of the standard salary level. Um, if the employer chooses not to make that catch-up payment, then the employee would be entitled to overtime pay for any overtime hours worked during the previous 52-week period. So let's say we're looking at a calendar year and we get to the end of December and you realize that the employee didn't make enough commissions or whatever other incentive payments to make sure that they met that salary threshold. So you have two decisions, you have two options. You can either make a catch up payment and that payment has to be made the next pay period all at one time, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, when, and just as a, as a side note, when you make that payment, it only applies to the uh, to make up the salary level for the previous year. So let's say end of 2021, I realize that an employee has a, uh, has, is maybe $2,000 short of making that salary threshold. So the first week of January, they get a $2,000 um, catch up payment in order to maintain that exempt status. Um, that $2,000 bonus is not credited towards 2022 as far as uh, making sure that they meet the exemption status again. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Mary Jane will talk a little bit more about the uh, exemption status. Uh, but if you decide not to, then you've got to go back and look at all of 2021 and all of the uh, weeks that the employee worked overtime, you're going to have to go back and calculate overtime pay for those weeks and then pay that. So uh, it's really important to keep an eye through the year to make sure employees who you are banking on making those incentive payments as part of the salary threshold that you're keeping an eye on that. So just wanna also make sure that uh, everybody's clear on the terms of discretionary and non-discretionary bonuses. They tend to be a little confusing for some. So a discretionary payment, which as the name implies is made at the discretion of the employer. So that could be um, you know, a gift card that you give on, on an employee's birthday, or it could be the holiday bonus that employees get. The amount, the requirements, and the timing aren't disclosed in advance. It's at the discretion of the employer. Those discretionary bonuses or payments don't need to be included when you're calculating overtime pay. Um, and they don't need, they're not included when you are uh, factoring in that salary threshold. The non-discretionary bonus or incentive payments, on the other hand, are based on standards that have to be met in order to receive such payments. So that might be a commission schedule, um, that might be a quarterly bonus based on performance of, uh, of a department or, or, uh, or, or of an individual. So again, the, uh, for non-discretionary, the amount, the requirements, and the timing are disclosed in advance. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Jane to answer that age old question, exempt or non-exempt? 
Very exciting question. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> um, yes, the exempt or non-exempt, and, and in order to satisfy the requirements of the Fair Labor Standards Act or FLSA, it is important to classify your employees in exempt or non-exempt, um, you know, for, for uh, purposes of, of pay. So a non-exempt um, employee is, is paid an an hourly wage, a salary, or a, a day rate, a job rate, a piece rate, or a commission. So they, those are things that they, uh, they may be paid in that way. Um, they must earn at least minimum wage for all hours worked, and they, they must be paid appropriate overtime pay for hours worked in, in one week. So you cannot combine weeks. Um, even if you pay every two weeks, it is Overtime is paid in a, a week. Again, that is, is um, based on, on federal in California. It is over eight hours in a day, but um, we're, we're talking about federally. So an exempt employee generally is paid um, a minimum of that $684 that Sherry had referred to, and also is paid on a salary basis, but they must meet the duties test um, exemptions, which we will be talking about, and that's, that's very important. So um, non-exempt employees, um, let's talk about non-exempts for a little bit here. So minimum wage, um, Obviously, the, uh, a covered non-exempt must be paid at least the federal minimum wage for the first 40 hours that, is, that are worked in a work week. Um, in federally, it's $7.25, but obviously there are um, you know, many states that, that pay more than that. So um, you do need to follow the, that, the, the state that you're in if it is more than that $7.25. Um, and the so the the employer e is entitled to the higher of those two minimum minimum wages okay and hours are um the statutory definition of employ includes to suffer or permit to work that that's what it actually means and hours worked ordinarily includes all time during which the employee is requ is required to be on the employer's premises or on duty um, as prescribed by the workplace, because some of you may have people that are being paid as a non-exempt, but they're working from home right now. Um, so they would still need to be paid for every hour that, that they're working if they are a non-exempt. Um, and work not requested, but suffered or permitted to be performed is work that must be paid. So as an example, if someone were to voluntarily or they chose to work late or um, they worked an you know an, a number of uh, you know minutes hours whatever at home answering email that you know you didn't direct them to but they chose to do you still have to pay them for that time it's still compensable time and so hours worked does include a variety of, of items which are going to be talking about here. Uh, waiting time, on-call time, meals and rest breaks, uh, training time, travel and, and sleep time. So waiting time, what that, you know, what that means are hours that are counted as work um, is when the employee is unable to use the time effectively for their own purpose. Um, and the time is controlled by the employer. So that the, those hours are counted as work time. It's not work time when the employee is completely relieved of their duty um, and the time is long enough that the employee can use it to effectively, you know, for their own purposes. So as an example, if you're in an environment where someone is, um, maybe it's manufacturing or even in an office environment and all the computers go down, the internet goes out, um, and they're waiting in which to start working again. They're not performing work, but it's compensable time. They're not permitted to leave. They're, they're doing, they need to work. Um, but if somebody were relieved of their duties and said that, you know, you can go home, um, then, then that would not be uh, uh, compensable time. But always keep in mind, too, um, that in some states there is uh, reporting pay. So if you were 
in Massachusetts, it's three hours. In New Hampshire, it's two. If you relieve someone of their duties and send them home and don't require them to come back, if they were scheduled for um, that three hours or more, you need to pay them for that time, um, just, just to keep that in mind. Now, um, on-call time. So on-call hours um, are hours worked when an employee is um, required um, to stay on the premises or has to stay close to the employer's premises that the, the employee cannot use the time effectively on their own. So, um, but an employee that um, is required to remain on call at home or, or, or who is allowed to leave a message of where they can be reached um, is not, not working in most cases. So um, additional constraints on the employee's freedom could require this time to be compensated. For example, an, an LPN is on call, must re remain within 15 minutes of the hospital, that on-call time might be compensable. Um, I have had um, clients that have chosen to pay people um, that are on call or give them a stipend just to, you know, as an, as an incentive, but it, it's not, um, if it's not compensable time, you don't have to do that, but uh, it, it might, it, it's some people do that. Um, meal and, and rest periods. Um, so meal periods um, are, are not work time when the employee is relieved of their duties for purposes of eating a meal. The shorter period of time, rest periods, like um, you know, a break in the morning, a break in the afternoon, normally anything between five and 20 minutes is counted as, as work um, and must be paid. So um, the thing about meals though, sometimes people will sit at their desk, they'll answer a phone, an email, that if they're doing work, it's compensable. So. I'm not saying somebody can't sit at their de desk and eat, but they ca it cannot be working. Um, and if they are, then you need to pay them, okay? And do be mindful of your state laws as to um, meal breaks, because um, some are very, uh, very particular about the amount of time that someone needs to take for, for a rest. Training time. So, um, it, things that, that need to be paid for regarding training, at the attendance at, at a lecture, a meeting, or, or training program um, do not need to be counted as working time if the, these four criteria are met. It's outside of normal working hours. It's, volunteer, it's voluntary, so you're not requiring it. It's not job-related, and no other work is concurrently performed. So you need to think about those those things um, in whether or not you're going to pay someone for training, okay? And travel time. So um, determining whether the time spent in travel is compensable depends on the kind of travel. So when somebody is traveling um, ordinarily to work from their home, that's not considered work time, except when the, um, it, it could be, you know, when the work uh, is a one day assignment in another city that could be compensable time. Um, travel to and from the city is considered work time. However, the employer, the employer can de de um, deduct the amount of time the employee normally would spend commuting to the regular work site. And also travel that is um, in the day, in the work day itself is compensable. So if you have somebody that you know, travels to multiple locations in one day. So they, you know, they go to work in, in one location, but then they have to go to another job site. That travel time between job sites is compensable time. Um, special rules do apply when someone is traveling away from their home um, for work, like for overnight uh, travel. So um, the time is not only hours worked on a regular working day during normal working hours, but also dur during corresponding hours on a non-working day. And what I mean by that is an, if an employee is required to travel away from home on a Sunday during regular, what would normally be a regular business hours so that they can be there Monday morning for a meeting, the travel time may be considered compensable. Um, the, the Department of Labor does not consider the time in travel away from home outside of regular working hours as a passenger on a plane, train, 
um, boat, bus, automobile as work time, but it could be tricky. For example, somebody could uh, it actually take a ride share to the airport at 9 a.m. on a Sunday, and that time isn't technically compensable. Um, while the employee drives himself to the airport at the same time, that could be co considered work time. So good rule of thumb is just to err on the side of caution, you know, when it comes to, to travel time. And, and sleep time, um, also an employer or an employee who's required to be on duty for less than 24 hours um, is working even though they're permitted to sleep or engage in other personal um, activity and um, when they're not busy. But an employee required to be on duty for 24 hours or more may agree with the employee to exclude those hours. Um, you know, that they would for those sleeping periods of not more than eight hours. Um, but the employer needs to pro provide adequate sleeping facilities, um, you know, for, for the employee. And the employee um, can usually enjoy an uninterrupted sleep. You know, so if they're, if they have to get up every hour, that's, that's, no, you can't do that. But if they have an un, can have an uninterrupted um, night's sleep, and the reduction um, is permitted unless it's less than five hours of sleep is taken. Okay, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sherry to, to, to talk about overtime. Thank you, Mary Jane. So under the FLSA, non-exempt employees have to receive overtime pay for hours worked in excess of 40 hours in a work week at a rate that's not less than time and a half of their regular rate of pay. So we've already talked about what counts as hours work. So let's define some of these other terms. All right. Okay. So work week is a fixed and regularly recurring period of 168 hours. That's seven consecutive 24 hour periods. So every employer has to, excuse me, determine a standard work week. And you can, you can have a work week set up at however you would like. So it could be a Monday through Sunday, a Sunday through Saturday. Uh, whatever works for you is fine, but it has to be a seven-day period. Um, and then determining that regular rate of pay, it's going to include all remuneration, which is paid in cash or otherwise, for the relevant work week, um, except for certain excluded payments that we'll review. So it's important to keep in mind that even if you pay on a biweekly or semi-monthly basis, the calculation of overtime pay, as Mary Jane mentioned earlier, has to be made on a work week, not on a pay period. So let's say you have a biweekly employee who's worked a total of 72 hours in the two-week period, but they worked 45 hours the first week and 27 hours the second week, they would be paid for five hours of overtime because, again, that overtime was worked in a work week. All right. So what is not included in that regular rate of pay are um, any expenses paid uh, uh, that were incurred on behalf of the employer, uh, premium payments for overtime work. So some employers, uh, in order to encourage um, uh, people to work uh, off hours, uh, might provide premium pay. So for example, um, if uh, somebody, uh, if a business has on-call employees, uh, they might say that we're going to pay you time and a half for any on-call hours that you work, uh, in order, again, as an incentive to answer the phone at three in the morning. Um, but those, uh, that premium payment isn't included when you're calculating the overtime rate, I'm sorry, the regular rate. Um, premium uh, pay for Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. So for example, here in Massachusetts, thanks, thanks to the uh, lovely blue laws, uh, retailers still have to pay, I think we're at 1.2 times um, excuse me, for Sunday work and certain holidays. Uh, so that premium pay is not included in that regular rate. Uh, Non-discretionary bonuses are not included as we discussed before. Uh, same thing with gifts on special occasions or payments for vacation holidays and illness. So hours paid for uh, vacation or holidays or sick time uh, is not included when you're calculating that overtime rate. I'm sorry, the regular rate. All right, so now we're gonna get into all the uh, really, really nitty gritty how you calculate overtime based on different types of uh, straight time rates. So when an employee works two or more different types of work at, at different established straight time rates in a work week, that rate for that week is a rated, a rated average. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you may have heard of it, heard it also called a blended overtime rate. 
So what we're going to do is look at some examples because I think sometimes seeing it as an example makes it a little more clear. And as a reminder, we are setting uh, sending out a copy of the slide deck as well as the link to the recorded session. Uh, so uh, if you need to review this afterwards, um, you'll be able to do that. All right, so let's look at employees who work at different straight time rates. So in this example, the employee works two different jobs for the same employer. They worked 21 hours as a janitor, making $8.50 an hour, and then they worked 26 hours as a cook, making $9 an hour. So to calculate our regular rate of pay, we take the total hourly earnings for both jobs and we uh, divide by the total number of hours worked. So our total earnings were $412.50, uh, and that already includes the one times. Remember, we have to pay one and a half times for any hours worked over 40 in a work week. So when we're paying, so when we're calculating this uh, overtime pay, we already paid the one times. So now we have to pay that extra half time. So, <clears throat> so excuse me. So we calculate that by taking our um, our total earnings, dividing by the number of hours, uh, four twelve fifty divided by those forty seven hours of work. That gave us a regular rate of pay of eight dollars and seventy eight cents. And then we're going to take half of that, which is $4.39. So those seven hours of overtime that the, uh, that the employee worked, they're going to also earn an additional $30.73 of uh, additional half-time pay. So their total wages due would be $443.23. All right, so that's for an employee who works two different straight-time rates. Um, many of you probably pay... Uh, certain positions as what that we refer to as salary non-exempt. Mary Jane mentioned earlier that non-exempt employees can be paid on an hourly basis, salary, piece rate, job rate, day rate. So how you pay them, those are just methods of pay, <clears throat> excuse me, but they still would be considered non-exempt. So you might have somebody, let's say a typical office environment, everybody works Monday through Friday, nine to five, um, and you might want to just make it simple, easy, easy to calculate uh, your payroll every week um, and, and easy for your employees to uh, and pay them at a straight salary for a fixed amount of hours. So in this case, we're going to say our fixed amount of hours is a 40 hour work week. So in this case, our employee uh, makes four hundred and twenty dollars uh, as salary. Uh, but in this particular work week, they actually ended up working 48 hours. So I'm going to take my salary of $420, I'm going to divide by 40 to get my regular rate of pay, which is going to be $10.50. So again, remember that our, um, our uh, $10.50 times 1.5 is $15.75. So that's my overtime rate. Um, and so for the extra hours that they work that week, they're going to be making their $420 for their 40 hours. And for those extra eight hours they work, they're going to be making an additional $15.75 an hour or $126 for that work week. So their total wages due are going to be $546. All right. So our next example is for salaried fixed hours, but for fixed hours of a 35-hour work week. Now, oftentimes this happens when you have people who work on Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, think of uh, like a doctor's office, a dentist's office, which oftentimes will close down for an hour in the middle of the day uh, and not have any patients coming in. Uh, so those people actually, because we're going to deduct that hour because it's a, a bona fide rest period, um, we're going to deduct that. So they're actually working a 35 hour work week. So the salary is based on a 35 hour work week. So, and now to calculate that overtime rate, we're gonna first take our $420 base salary, divide by 35 hours, because that's how, much, how many hours that salary is for. So that gives us a regular rate of pay of $12. Then we're gonna take that $12 and multiply it by five to give us our $60, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the $12 times 1.5, our overtime rate is then $18. And then we have $18 times the eight hours, because don't forget we worked eight hours of overtime that week. So I, I worked first five extra hours because my base salary is only for 35 hours. I worked five hours at $12 an hour, extra $60. Then I worked another, um, excuse me, another eight hours at my overtime rate of $18. This is $144. So my total wages due are going to be $624. All right. 
and then fluctuating work weeks. So a fluctuating work week is when you have employees who uh, you're paying, excuse me, um, a base salary for all hours work and their work week truly fluctuates. Um, so let's say we're talking about a, um, an employee who is uh, on the road um, uh, uh, in an exempt position, but they are on the road and their work week really varies. Some weeks they might work 30 hours, some weeks they might work 50 hours. You go, you're promising them a base pay for all hours work. That is, has to be established ahead of time. Uh, so if in this particular case, our fluctuating work week employee uh, worked, uh, it gets a base salary of $420 for all hours worked, and they worked 49 hours in a work week. So in order to get our regular rate of pay, we're gonna take that $420, divide by 49, and we get $8.57. Um, so again, um, that 857 times 0.5, remember we already paid for the one times, so we only have to pay for the half time now. Um, so the uh, 857 regular rate at half time is $4.29. So for the extra nine hours, because remember we worked 49 hours in a work week, um, so we have nine hours of overtime, we're going to pay that extra half time at $4.29 times nine hours is $38.61. So total wages due is going to be 45, I'm sorry, $458.61. All right. And our last example are for employees who make a weekly commission. So this one gets a little tricky. So in this case, we have an employee, excuse me, who uh, makes $10 an hour times 50 hours. Um, and they also have a commission of $100 for that particular work week. So we're going to take our total amount earned, because we're going to add in the commission, plus my hourly rate of $600 divided by 50. So now I have a regular hourly rate that's going to be $12 an hour. So again, we've already paid the one times. Uh, so we're going to calculate what our overtime rate is, which is the halftime rate, which is $12 times 0.5 or $6. So we're going to take that $6, and again, remember, we worked 50 hours this week, so that's 10 hours of overtime. So the 6 times 10, $60. So our total wages due are going to be $660. So hopefully I haven't confused you too much, but um, let's talk about deferred commissions. This one gets really, really tricky. So if you're not paying your commissions on the weeks that they were earned, uh, so, for example, maybe uh, commissions are paid on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. Uh, you have to then go back for your non-exempt employees and factor in that deferred commission into any overtime pay they should have earned for the period that was covered for that commission. Uh, so, uh, until the commission is actually paid, the employer can pay the employee for overtime at a rate not less than one and a half times their hourly rate excluding the commission, and then once the commission is computed and paid, the employer has to calculate the additional overtime that's owed, and the employee has to be paid additional overtime for each week during the period that they work in excess of 40 hours. So we're going to take our commissions, and we're going to factor that in when we're calculating that regular rate of pay to determine our overtime rate. So um, again, very, very confusing on that, but it is very important to make sure that you're factoring in those deferred commissions for anybody who is a non-exempt commission employee. Okie dokie. Um, so one of the other things that the FLSA addresses are deductions from wages. Um, so the federal law allows employers to deduct the cost of things like uniforms, tools, supplies, uh, breakage, cash register shortages, and things like that from an employee's pay as long as the employee's wages after the deductions doesn't fall below minimum wage. Now, with that said, please remember, state law may differ. And I have to tell you, in many states, it does. Uh, some states do not allow employers to pass along certain costs to employees. So it's important to know the wage and hour laws in the states in which you have employees. Cannot emphasize that enough. Okay, so let's talk about some of the common overtime mistakes. Um, assuming managers are not entitled to overtime. Just because a manager, a person is called a manager doesn't necessarily mean that they are an, an, an exempt employee. Mary Jane is going to go over the, uh, the different uh, uh, duties tests for exempt employees. 
but just by title only does not make them um, uh, non-exempt. I'm sorry, exempt. Uh, assuming that all salaried employees are exempt. So oftentimes when we have, uh, we're paying, let's say we've got, um, let's say that we have our accounts payable, accounts receivable person who works Monday through Friday, nine to five, um, and they are paid a set salary, but maybe at quarter end or year end, they have to be making work a few more hours or maybe they come in on a Saturday uh, to help you know, finish up um, the books. Those hours still would be considered um, uh, over, uh, for overtime pay. Uh, another common mistake is making or allowing employees to perform work off the clock. So oftentimes, and it almost seems it almost seems counterintuitive when you have an employee who is so diligent that they know they haven't finished their project, they punch out and then stick around just to finish it up. And as Mary Jane alluded to earlier, um, even if the employee is punched out, um, they it is still compensable time if you are allowing them to work. Now, if you have a policy that says nobody gets to work overtime, then you're gonna, you still have to pay them, but you're gonna handle that as a disciplinary issue. Um, providing compensatory time in lieu of overtime. Some employers do that. That is very common in the, um, in the uh, uh, public sector, but it is not allowed in the private sector. Um, failing to consider non-discretionary bonuses and commissions in calculating overtime pay is a very common mistake. Also failing to comply with applicable state laws, uh, again, in local laws, so important to know what those are. Failing to use a weighted average to calculate regular rates of pay. Averaging the hours between the two work weeks, as we discussed, if you're paying biweekly, you still have to calculate overtime based on a work week. Not tracking hours actually worked. So that's for, especially for telecommuters. And that's one thing COVID has done to us is it has really pushed so many of us to uh, working remotely, working from home, very hard sometimes to uh, uh, differentiate between work and non-work hours when you know, your, your, uh, your workplace and your, your uh, place of residence are one and the same. Um, and then also paying a fixed salary for a work week um, that uh, exceeds 40 hours. Again, you can pay for a work week that exceeds 40 hours, but you still have to pay overtime pay for that. All right, and with that, I'm turning it back over to Mary Jane to talk about those elusive white collar exemptions. Thank you, Sherry. Yeah, so let's take a look at those, uh, those white collar exemptions. So there are, um, there are a few that uh, we're going to be talking about today, which include um, executive, administrative, learned professional, creative professional, computer professional, outside sales, and highly compensated um, employees. There are some other, um, other information on this that you can look at uh, at the DOL website as well, and we're going to share a, the, um, a resource page at the end so that, that you'll have that as well. But um, the first, um, the FLSA outlines a three-pronged test to determine whether your employee is exempt. Most employees must meet all three of these tests to be considered exempt for, from overtime. And the first is the salary uh, level test. Generally, employees are paid less than uh, that are paid less than the 35, uh, 568 per year are non-exempt, and those who earn more than um, the 107.432 are exempt, but again, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, you you want to take into some other considerations too, but also remember the state and local uh, laws, as as Sherry had mentioned. Um, some some jurisdictions have uh, different levels uh, for the salary test. So the salary um, salary basis typically, an employee um, is paid a salary if they're they can count on receiving a guaranteed minimum amount of money for um, for the work week in which they're performed. That means that you can't deduct from the exempt employee's pay based on the numbers of hours worked. So, you know, again, a typical work week is 40 hours a week. Um, as an exempt employee, somebody could work 35 hours and next week work you know, 60 hours, you're not paying them per hour. So even if they work less than 40, um, you, you aren't, um, you're paying them for the job, not, not the hours. And the, um, the duties test, the third and final is the duties test. 
each exemption has specific duties that must be performed in order to be considered exempt from overtime. Job titles or position descriptions are not always uh, the be all end all in determining whether someone is exempt. It really is about what the person does um, and how the job fits into the employer's overall operations um, that determine whether they are exempt from overtime. So the, the first that we're gonna speak about is the executive exemption. Um, so in addition to the salary and the salary basis test, um, the primary duty must be managing the enterprise or managing a customarily recognized department or subdivision. Um, and customarily and regularly direct the work of at least two or more full-time employees or their equivalent. And also the authority to hire, fire other employees or the employee's suggestions and recommendations as to the hiring and firing, advancement, promotion, and other uh, change status of the employees must be given particular weight. So factors to consider in particular weight is determining whether their that employee's recommendation to hire fire advanced etc um it that weight it, uh is not limited to um whether the it's part of the employee's job to make the recommendation and the and the frequency of which those recommendations are made and requested and relied upon the employee's recommendations may still be deemed as particular weight, even if a higher level manager's recommendation is more um, holds more importance, and even if the employee does not have the authority to make the ultimate decision as to the employee's change in status. So you really have to take uh, into consideration what the, what that particular weight is. The administrative exemption. Um, so what this what the administration exemption is is primary duty must be the performance of office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operation of the employer or employer's customers and it the it includes the um the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of significance all of the and you're going to get these slides but all of these things that are highlighted are very important and have very specific definitions so um, directly related to management or general business operations um, the employee must perform work directly related to assisting with the running or servicing of the business uh, of the bus business itself and that's distinguished from somebody that is working say on a production line or selling a product in a re retail um, environment. Discretion and independent judgment. Um, generally, the ex exercising discretion and independent judgment involves uh, com compar comparison and evaluation of possible courses of conduct and acting or making a decision after various possibilities have, con have been considered. Um, and it implies that the employee has the authority to make an independent choice free from immediate um, immediate direction or supervision. And factors to consider are the authority to formulate, affect, interpret, implement, manage policies or operating practices, whether or not the employee carries out major assignments in conducting the operations of the business and whether the employee performs work that affects business operations to a substantial degree and um, whether the employee has the authority to commit the employer to matters of significant financial impact and whether the employee has the authority to waive or deviate from policies and procedures without prior approval. So these are all things you have to consider if you're gonna say this person falls into this administrative exemption. Um, matters of significant refers to the level of importance or consequence of the work performed. An employee doesn't have to exercise discretion and independent judgment with respects to matters of, of significance um, merely because the employee will experience financial loss, okay? Um, the learned professional, this is, this is um, you know, referring to, to an employee that has uh, required advanced knowledge um, to, to do their job, which is defined predominantly by intellectual in character and which involves working um, 
required the consistent exercise of discretion and independent judgment, usually in the field of science and learning, and customarily required for prolonged um, course of specialized intellectual um, inst instruction. So, and the salary level does not apply to teachers, doctors, and lawyers in this particular um, in this particular case. But it is, as I say, predominantly that intellectual character um, or um, or schooling and 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 such. The um, creative professional that um, is is something where people fall into the field of, of uh, artist or a creative endeavor. Someone could be paid on a, um, a some basis or a single job, but this typically uh, is for people that are in music, writing, acting, and graphic arts. And the computer professional, um, under this particular exemption, again, the, um, the, the primary duties are very specific and it, it, um, it doesn't encompass all types of computer work. Um, obviously, there's, you know, computer uh, system analysts, computer programmer, software engineer, and other, other skilled workers. So there's um, primary, um, hold on one second. So the, yeah, the, uh, the, um, those, those that fall under this computer professional exemption are application of system analysis techniques, um, design and development of um, computer systems and programs, et cetera. So, and again, I'm gonna, we're gonna give you these slides so that you can read, read these um, that what fall into that computer um, exemption. And outside sales is just that, it's outside sales. Inside sales is not an exempt uh, employee, outside sales is. So the, um, an outside sales person makes sales outside of the place of business. You know, it, so it also may be that um, we are needing, you know, you may have somebody that's working from home because of the, of, uh, the pandemic, but they're not, you know, they're not outside salesperson, an outside salesperson. They need to be outside, really, really calling on customers um, away from business. And then the highly compensated um, e exemption, this is uh, somebody that is performing office or non-manual work that is over that compensation of just under uh, 108,000 a year. And um, so that that's if typically, again, if it's non-manual, they, they would fall into um, the highly compensated, but they still need to be in one of the other, the exempt, um, executive, administrative, professional, that type of thing, okay? And common mistakes similar to you know, what, what Sherry was talking about before, always classifying a salaried uh, employee as an exempt. They may not be, you know, um, they, they are always classifying a supervisor as an exempt. If you have a supervisor that is um, working a line with somebody and they're just telling people what, what machine to go on, um, and they're doing the same work all day long with them that they are likely not an exempt employee. Uh, and classifying exemptions based on job descriptions and title only, just because you call them a manager does not make them exempt. And um, making deductions from the exempt employee's paycheck, again, can't do that. And classifying, also classifying em uh, employees who work as on computers as computer professionals. You really have to look at the detail of what they do. And also always classifying a com uh, commissioned employer or a commissioned employee as, as exempt. They may not be, they could be an inside salesperson. Um, and equating job, all jobs performed by highly educated employees as exempt. Just because someone has the education, if their job is not requiring that education, doesn't mean they fall into that exemption. And deductions um, from employees' checks. So if deductions that are allowed from an exempt employee are full day absences for personal reasons like sickness or disability, um, or uh, you know, a bona fide sick plan, or maybe jury duty or witness duty or, or uh, military pay. And um, also, not that this is done often, but if there was a penalty that was imposed on good because of good faith, um, you know, maybe there was an infraction of safety and or disciplinary action. You know, I don't know if someone were in a 
uh, an environment where something was flammable and they were smoking cigarettes next to something that might be a violation, you might suspend them and, and suspend them without pay. So that could be, could be an example. I know I flew through that, so I I, uh, I apologize, but we're, we are running close. So I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Sherry to talk about record keeping and enforcement. Thanks, Mary Jane. And yeah, you know I have to say that I have had the uh, pleasure, if you can call it that, of uh, sitting through uh, a number of uh, both uh, state and federal uh, Department of Labor audits, and I have to tell you that they are gonna take your uh, your uh, payroll register and your timekeeping records. And they're literally going to check one to the other to make sure people are being paid proper overtime. But the other thing they're going to do is challenge you on how, and any employees that you're paying as exempt. And I will tell you that they don't just look at those job descriptions or job titles like Mary Jane was just saying. They actually call or speak to every single employee that is being paid as exempt and say, what do you do? How, how often do you do it? How much, how much of your time is spent doing this duty or that duty? And then that auditor makes the determination whether they are a valid exempt employee or whether they don't meet those standard duties tests. And if they don't meet the standard duties test, they're gonna turn around and you're gonna owe um, back overtime wages uh, and in addition to that, generally liquidated uh, liquidated um, wages as well. So it can get extremely costly. Making changes now, um, it, when you realize that somebody is not being paid correctly, can really help you if you're going to be going through a Department of Labor audit because they see that you're acting in good faith, which means that you still may have to pay those back overtime wages, but you may not have any penalties or fines. So it really is worth re-examining on a regular basis, higher paying employees, updating those job descriptions and making sure that people are being classified correctly. All right, let's finish up by talking about the record keeping and enforcement uh, under the FLSA. All right, so uh, under record keeping, um, employers can choose any kind of timekeeping method they want as long as it's complete and accurate. So the FLSA doesn't dictate how you have to track hours, it just says you have to do it. Um, for a fixed schedule, so you've got, again, an office environment where everybody works Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, you don't have to have a specific timekeeping method, but you could just use that exact schedule and then just show any times or any uh, indicate any times that the worker didn't follow that schedule. But as a general rule of thumb, you have to record all hours worked by non-exempt employees. You do not have to record hours worked for exempt employees. But, but for non-exempt employees, you do. I know some employers do um, track hours for exempt employees, oftentimes for billing purposes for customers or clients, um, but it is not a requirement. All right, the other requirement is that the records have to include certain identifying information about the employee and the data about the hours worked and wages earned. I didn't include the list here, but there's a link here to the Department of Labor site that gives you a list of all of that information that has to be included in your record keeping. And the employer is required to retain those payroll records for at least three years. And you, they will go back um, up to three years when they're doing an audit. So uh, speaking of audits, the enforcement for the FLSA uh, is uh, done by the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. Um, where violations are found, investigators may recommend changes in employment practices to bring the employer into compliance. Um, there's generally a two-year statute of limitations, which means when they're doing that audit, um, if they find violations, they're going to go back two years, look at all of your pay records, and determine within those two years how many people were due overtime wages that weren't paid. Um, but if they look at it and see willful violation, they actually will go back up to three years. Um, so what could it cost you? Uh, recovery of back wages. So uh, they, they will supervise the payment of back wages. I know in my experience with clients that have been through this, uh, once they calculate that total amount due, they're only given three months to make that payment. And those payments can be pretty substantial. Um, the Secretary of Labor may also bring suit for back wages of an equal amount as liquidated damages, which actually is also paid to the employees. And then the employee uh, can, uh, can also file a private suit for back pay and an equal amount of liquidated damages plus attorney's fees and court costs 
it can get very expensive. Uh, speaking of expensive, those penalties. So for willful violations, uh, the FLSA uh, can uh, might result in a criminal prosecution and the violators can be fined up to $10,000. A second conviction can result in imprisonment. Uh, they're pretty serious about this stuff. Uh, willful or repeated violations is subject to a penalty, penalty of up to $1,000 for each violation. Um, and sometimes each violation can be each pay period. So again, can get very costly. And then violators of child labor law provisions are subject to a penalty of up to $10,000 for each violation. All right, so um, brings us to our final slide, which is our Department of Labor Resources. Uh, there's a handy reference guide for the, to the FLSA, uh, covers a lot of the information we talked about today. Um, there's a compliance assistant Department of Labor standpoint, uh, resource that's really very helpful. Um, and the one thing that I reference very frequently are these Department of Labor topical fact sheet index. I have to tell you, they have a fact sheet on just about everything and everybody. So uh, for every type of position. So it's really worth looking through. Uh, so for example, for teachers, uh, you want to you wanna know, uh, you know what, what is required for payment for a teacher or for certain types of positions, inside sales, outside sales, there's a topical fact sheet for that. So, and I do apologize, we are not able to uh, get to the questions because we are at the end of the hour. Uh, but if we have your email address for some of those questions, uh, we'll try to respond directly. Uh, and with that, I am going to turn it back over to Amy to uh, take us home. Thank you, Sherry and Mary Jane. What a great program. Uh, be sure to join us next week for part two of worker classification. Also check out the website. We have a number of uh, great programs coming up on employee handbooks, remote recruiting, innovative strategies for training and development um, in a remote and hybrid environment. Lots of great webinars on our website under resources. Just a quick reminder too, that we'll be sending out a link to the recording as, as well as the PowerPoint later today. Thank you all for attending and have a terrific rest of your day.